Galen Erickson is the cattle industry professor um, of animal science at uh, University of Nebraska. I think you all know what his research focus has been, uh, corn co-products, nutrient balance, growth promotion, and feeding of feedlot cattle. He has several awards, both uh, locally and nationally, um, a host of publications. One of the things that's listed here in his bio, that he's worked with 53 graduate students, and I think that's commendable. He has uh, advanced degrees from the University of Nebraska, and Galen, most importantly, he has a BS from Iowa State University. <laughs> I don't know. I remember those days, and I think I've changed some, but it did give me a good start for sure. Actually, that's a funny story. I, I got to credit, uh, obviously, a lot of things, a lot of mentorship and stuff over the years, but uh, Alan, Alan Trinkle, who some of you will know, who's at Iowa State, uh, gave me a job as a young college kid who probably didn't know much. So I got to credit him for some, some of that start. So it's true that Iowa State helped me. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Uh, for this, <laughs> it doesn't matter the topic. It does matter. <laughs> <not the topic. laughs> so some people have asked, you know, uh, and, and I appreciate this because there's a fair amount of people here from media and uh, asked, well, why are you doing this, and why is there interest in it? Um, so I want to set that stage a bit, but one of the reasons we got involved in this uh, is, is because I think there's some opportunity for, for beef producers that we probably uh, overlook some, and I think there's greater opportunity because of distillers grains, which is kind of what Andrea set up. So I'm going to try and go through these different topics. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about, I, I'm going to try and focus on finishing now, okay, so the whole concept was Andrea's going to talk about growing, and clearly protein's the most important considerations for those growing cattle. Now I'm going to skip to finishing and, uh, and primarily talk about energy and, and things. So I'm going to start with what's the impact of inclusion and how does distiller's grains influence that now on the finishing side, then a little bit on some hybrid issues and work that's in the literature, and then uh, I mentioned I would talk a little bit about kernel processing and come back a little bit and revisit what Jim presented on the impact on performance when you harvest it at different maturities and then end with just a slight mention of drought damage silage. So this is, uh, this is actually from Iowa State. It's uh, prices paid to Iowa corn farmers over uh, since 1980 to this last year. And we started getting more interested in silage back here because historically, so, so everybody's aware of this spike in, in grain prices, right? Uh, historically, as corn got more expensive, there was more interest in silage. So that's one reason why we got more excited about silage. Second reason is, and I've stolen this from Jim McDonald and Terry uh, Klopfenstein on this, and that is, uh, the amount of dry residue that's produced. This graph is actually the graph for corn grain production uh, times 0.8 because we assumed 80% of corn yield is actually the same amount as forage that's produced of dry corn. So my point is this is grain production since 1950 which is exactly the same thing as corn residue production. Now my understanding is is that seed companies may have ways to select grain corn that will produce more grain and not as much forage, but on average that's not happened in the past 60, 70 years. So the more grain we produce, the more forage it's produced as well. So we've been interested in how do we use residue more? Well, there's three ways. Well, two, two main ways, and then within harvesting there's two ways. So grazing, which doesn't fit me as a feedlot person so well, it's hard to finish them grazing corn stalks, but it is by far the best way to use corn residue. Okay? So that's just to be clear, it's not going to fit everybody. So if it doesn't fit everybody, the second best option is to harvest it. And once you harvest it, you can harvest it as silage or as stalks. So that's where I did want to come in. Since we're going to make this a big focus of using residue, I was very interested in how do we fit silage into that program to harvest all this residue that's being produced. It offsets grain, saves the good stuff, which we've already discussed about, and it fits uh, Nebraska slash Iowa slash this region very well 
for integrated crop livestock operations. And then we've got other work on baled stocks, which doesn't apply today. Third reason is Terry's going to talk in much more depth. We put Terry and me at the end because we thought people may want to leave and then they'll miss the worst part of the program, right? Me and Terry. So, uh, no, all joking aside, uh, we, we thought it was most logical to go in this order and talk about the economics at the end. So this is going to be discussed in quite detail. But price per unit of energy, corn silage is a good buy. At least I hope that's what Terry's going to discuss. Now, some of you recall, this is a good example of silage not being a new concept. Uh, Minnesota had probably done as much work as anybody on corn silage back in the 60s and 70s. And back then, with their scenario of 350 a bushel, it's kind of funny, isn't it? 1974, 350 a bushel. In real dollars, corn was much more expensive even than when it was seven or eight dollars today, or in the last decade. So the point is, they had expensive corn in that time period, and they looked at feeding 10, 20, 30, all the way up to 80 percent silage. More silage you fed, less grain you fed. Make sense? So it's different ratios, essentially, of corn to corn silage. Now this is long before, not long before we had distillers, but certainly long before we had the quantity of distillers that we have, and it was not commonly fed to beef cattle at least in this part of the country. So what happens? As you increase silage in the, uh, in the diet at the expense of corn, in general, gain goes down. Intake stayed about the same, maybe went up and down. Conversions clearly get worse, OK? So many people have said, well, why are you doing this work with silage? Because you're going to hurt performance. That's true. But based on their economics from that day, you tended to make more money. So that's where it ties into why we were interested in that. Now, maybe one of the poorer students from the University of Nebraska that's been here uh, did some of this work 15 years ago. This was part of my graduate program, where we actually fed 15, 30, or 45 percent silage to finishing cattle. This is a, a summary of three experiments combined. And guess what happens? As we fed more silage, you know, intake maybe tended to go up quadratically. Uh, clearly, gain went down. In this case, it was quadratic. That just means it drops off quite a bit and then not much. Fee conversion got worse quadratically. Got quite a bit worse going to 30% and then kind of leveled off. Not dramatically different than what the Goodrich data from 74 said. Okay, so that's all I'm pointing out. There was no distiller's grains in these diets. So uh, Dirk Birkin, when he was here as part of his PhD uh, program, we said, let's revisit this. But what's different today is that there's distiller's grains in the diet. So some of you have seen this, but I want to at least briefly summarize it again quickly. We fed uh, 15, 30, 45, or 55 percent silage. Notice all those diets had 40% distillers in them. Okay, so a lot of distillers, especially relative to today, but that was the key difference why we wanted to revisit this was now we're going to put distillers in a diet and see what's the impact of, uh, on performance as we increase silage. So this diet, notice, has no corn, grain. I should say that differently. Has no corn grain as an ingredient. It has corn grain from the silage, right? That's obvious to everybody, but... Uh, so, and then we had a 45% silage, no distillers diet, and then no grain, but increased the distillers. So we were trying to kind of get a handle on what's the impact of, of getting rid of grain or getting rid of the distillers. That was our goal. So to start with, what happened? Ultimately, this feed conversion graph is the most important one. You've got the tables. I think you have this table in the proceedings. Gain went down linearly. Fee conversion got worse linearly. It got 1.5% worse when it went from 15 to 30. And again, just to reiterate, you heard what Eric and Kai said in the panel. The norm, at least in our opinion, was 15% silage in the finishing diet. Now, we have a mixture of attendees here in terms of nutritionists and producers. To be really clear with everybody, when I say 15%, that means 15% on a dry basis. Uh, 
uh, I'm looking at Jack because you're sitting on the end. But from a producer's perspective, that's not as fed, so that's not what's weighed in the truck. You'd have to weigh more than that to compensate for the moisture. So 15, we doubled it, tripled it, et cetera. So conversions got worse as we increased silage. What about this, this issue here of 45% silage with and without distillers? Well, all that comparison says is that when we feed distillers, we get better performance than when we don't, which we've seen a lot of times. But that doesn't really answer that question of if increasing silage helps or not with distillers. Then the one with no, no corn uh, at 30% silage and 65% distillers or 30% silage and 40% distillers, going to too much distillers also hurt gain and uh, didn't, it tended to hurt conversions. Okay, so and again, that's not dramatically different than some of our other data. So I want everybody to think about this. We are interested in what happens with maybe more normal levels of distillers. I'm going to say 20 to 40%. And as you change inclusion of the still uh, of silage, so Dirk thought that this was all related to him versus me as students, but this is now gain to feed. Okay, so it's feed efficiency. The higher the number, the better. This green line summarizes going from 15 to 30 to 45 to 55 percent silage, but all of these diets have 40 percent distillers in them. This blue line summarizes what happened in, in the trials that I was involved with as a student where you went from 15 to 30 to 45, but without distillers in the diet. Now remember, that's not a fair comparison directly because it's 15 years apart, 13 years apart. I'm getting old, I guess. I guess that's what it tells me too. Uh, so what, what we also then want to do is go back, and so part of what Dirk did is he looked at feeding 20% distillers with 15 or 45% silage, and then 40% distillers with 15 or 45% silage. Does that make sense? So what I really want to focus in on is these four treatments. Now we did have another diet in with just stocks. So if you look at just 5% stocks with 40% distillers, and 15% silage with 40% distillers, pretty comparable performance, which doesn't shock me. If you have 40% distillers, you can interchange 5% stocks or 15% silage. The, the work out of Texas and other places shows that. Our data shows that. So that's good. But what's most intriguing here is that we saw about a 13% hurt or, or, or I guess increase or uh, it got poor in uh, feed conversion as we went to 45% silage with only 20 distillers and a 4% change when we went had the diets with 40% distillers. Now we repeated that because these were big yearlings fed through the winter and we had a tough winter that year. So you can see those conversions are nothing to uh, get excited about. But then, of course, whenever you repeat something, it never works exactly the same. So we did it again, same exact treatments, different group of cattle, much better performance, 5% change, 5.6% change. So I guess I'm, I, I've got to tell you that we did one trial that showed that, that going from 15 to 45% silage was better if you had 40% distillers in diet. We have another one that says it doesn't really matter if there's 20 or 40% distillers. I'd probably put more weight in this because of the lack of environmental influence. This illustrates those interactions well. So this is the first experiment going from 15 to 45 percent silage with 20 distillers, 15 to 45 with 40, and then basically the same response, uh, whether it was 20 or 40 percent distillers in the second experiment. So I think the data are still clear, though that as you feed more silage, meaning going above a traditional roughage inclusion of 15%, you will hurt feed conversions. We're trying to quantify that exactly by doing these studies, because that's important, and it tends to depress average daily gain. I don't think it's as much as long as you have distillers in the diet at 20 to 40%. That all changes if you don't put in 20% distillers. I think that will all change, is my only caution to you. Now, about everybody's feeding 20% distillers as a minimum, which is, I think, smart, 
but I think it's important to point that out. We've not directly compared that effect of having no distillers to having some distillers and also changing the silage. The point is, is that we've been wrestling with this, but in some respects, it would be great to do about every single common combination or ratio of corn to silage to distillers, right? Because if we had every single combination, that would answer the questions that you would have at any point in the future. That's just not been done, and it's kind of it's a little difficult task. My other point is, growing up in Iowa, I remember how we used to finish cattle as a kid. We'd put them on silage. And about a year later, guess what? They make it to market. So my point is, you can finish cattle on silage diets. And I don't think going to 45% silage just means you can't finish cattle. You can finish them. It just takes longer. Economics will drive that, which Terry's going to set us up, and I think it fits for farmer feeders. Now, I put farmer feeder on purpose there. What I really mean by that is private feedlots. So what do I mean by private? I own the cattle. I do not think this is going to go well for a custom yard. Why? Because custom yards are very much driven and evaluated based on feed conversions and performance in their yard. So if they don't own the cattle, this doesn't fit. But if it can make you more money on the cattle, you may be willing to give up some performance. I think that's the challenge and difference between private and custom. Okay, I'm going to shift gears then and go through the rest of those topics uh, somewhat uh, succinctly, I hope. Uh, We've talked about this one. I want to just hit the GMO thing head on. This is a growing study looking at different uh, BT versus non-BT and early maturing, BT or non-BT and late maturing hybrids. You know, no real effect on, on uh, gain. If anything, maybe BT a little higher. No real effect on conversions. In one case, BT was higher. Uh, another case, it was poor. Uh, another study looking at herbicide tolerance. Um, this is the herbicide tolerant silage hybrid, 80% corn silage diet, no effects on gain compared to a near isogenic parent or two other hybrids, no effect on conversion. Pretty easy conclusion in my opinion if you look at all the agronomic data on GMOs that are, that are, that are genetically enhanced for agronomic traits, zero impact on performance. And I get a lot of questions still about BT corn especially. The data do not support that there's any negative effect on performance. I want to switch gears into brown midrib because I think that's an important trait to, to understand, especially when we talk about silage. Uh, limited literature, frankly, on the beef side for brown midrib. Much more data available for brown midrib silages in the dairy side. Uh, I apologize, this got spread out, but this is work by Kent Tajardis when he was in graduate school, published in 2000, it's in the, in the proceedings, the reference is. Uh, and I also apologize, this is in kilograms, the intake is. He looked at ad libitum fed control silage or a BMR hybrid, and then he restricted intake, so that's why those intakes are the same on the control and BMR. Uh, dry matter digestibility, Having it be a BMR increase, the dry matter digestibility, dramatic increases in the fiber digestibilities, both NDF and ADF, and no effect on starch. That's what BMR hybrids do, right? Lower in lignin, dramatic improvement in fiber digestibility. That was in growing cattle, but it was a digestion study. The thing I'm puzzled by is in that specific experiment that they published, they went ahead and grew some cattle for 112 days and didn't see an improvement. In fact, feed efficiency was a little worse. So I was going to ask Ken. I didn't know if he's not here today. Uh, but I, I'm puzzled by that response because it does not support all of the other literature, especially in dairy. As far as I'm aware, and I'm not saying I'm the best at searching out all the literature, but I, I do fair, I think. As far as I'm aware, the only other published study I can find uh, in recent literature is uh, by Keith, I'm sorry, I think that's Keith at all, 1981J at Journal of Animal Science. Uh, they, fed, they fed a control or BMR corn silage growing diet, corn silage plus one, corn fed at 1% of body weight, or corn silage plus corn fed at 2% of body weight. Again, a very common way of feeding cattle back in the day, so to speak. Feeding the BMR silage grower increased gain, no effect, at least statistically on conversions. When added 2% corn, 
no effect on gain or conversions, but that's probably because silage was quite a bit lower. Uh, second year, so this is the first year, this is the second year, feeding a BMR hybrid, increased gain, didn't have any effect as you fed more corn. So if you want to see the effect of the BMR hybrid on improving fiber digestibility, you're going to pick that up easier in a silage growing diet or higher inclusions of, of silage for finishing cattle. I think more work has to be done in that area. Kernel processing. This one, if, if I didn't make everybody, if I didn't alienate everybody already on BMR, I'm going to certainly do it right now. Because we already talked about kernel processing, and I'm well aware that we have custom harvesters in the room, and everybody and their brother, so to speak, want to have kernel processed silage. And again, I may not be the best at searching out all the literature, but I can only find two studies in the literature related to beef cattle. I'm going to show you both of them. This is some good work out of Iowa State from a few years ago, 1987. It's a digestion study, and they harvested the silage and then rolled it, was what I understood from reading the methods. Put the silage up at about the same dry matter, same NDF and crude protein, got about the same lactate, maybe a little bit more. Clearly down here at the bottom, this gives you confidence that it worked what they did. 19%, and they did a really unique study there, or a really unique method, I thought. They used a dye and looked at dye being taken up or not by the, by the kernel on whether it was a whole, truly a whole kernel or not. So they came up with 19% whole kernels in the control silage and 1% in the roll. So I think they did an effective job of processing the kernels is my point. Digestibility, not significant on dry matter, organic matter, NDF, maybe a slight depression, but not significant. They did improve starch digestion. So I think the data are clear, especially when you look at the dairy literature. If you kernel process silage, you improve starch digestibility. That's been measured routinely. My question is, what's it do to performance? So again, they fed it in a low, medium, or high energy diet. If you want to know what those were, that's 65% silage. 25% hay is the low. Medium is basically a silage growing diet with protein supplementation. And the high is 60% silage and corn. Is that clear to everybody? That's important, I think. Well, maybe it's not. No effect on gain, if it was, pro if it was rolled or not. No significant effect on feed conversion. Now, I'll grant you that that's a pretty big difference. So it was four reps per treatment from what I recall, but not significant, but certainly a numerical response with this low energy diet. Goes the opposite way for the medium silage grower. Numerically goes the right way, but not significant when you're talking about a finisher. So my question is, as far as I'm aware, uh, that's the only performance trial I can find related to beef cattle on kernel processing. I'm, I'm willing to be proven wrong on that if somebody knows. The other study that was in the literature related to beef cattle was a digestion study out of Idaho. Carl Hunt did the work. And uh, basically, they looked at harvesting at milk, half milk line or full milk line. So this is maturity. I'm not as interested in that for this as I am the processing part. Uh, so kernel processed versus not. No effect on dry matter digestibility, improvement in starch digestibility, significantly negative effect on fiber digestibility. So again, supports kernel processing improving starch digestibility, does not support it improving overall digestibility. So I was puzzled by that. So here's where I'm going to really go out on a limb, because there's some dairy folks in here. This was a meta-analysis. Uh, Randy Shaver, and fair number of comparisons in here. I'm going to focus in on this kernel processing part. You look at kernel processing data and their meta-analysis from the literature, one to three millimeter versus four to eight versus unprocessed. Digestibility, maybe a little improvement at the, at the small particle size if it's processed. Maybe a little improvement on organic matter digestibility was significant. Fiber digestibility, maybe. Total tract starch digestibility, yes, but not, not dramatic. 
Here's my key. Milk production or fat corrected milk production, not different than unprocessed. So that surprised me because everybody talks about processing and kernel processing improving milk production. I'm willing to be proven wrong, but I've read six of the 60 and well, I say that here. Surprising little impact in dairy, I'm willing to be wrong and proven wrong, but I've read six of the 60 that are out there and they all say somewhat similar, not a dramatic impact. And uh, again, I'm not in my area, so I'm not gonna focus on that. What I can focus on is there's very limited data in the beef area, and I think that we have a dire need for more if we're gonna justify and recommend kernel processing for beef cattle. There's no doubt there's two benefits. It does allow you to increase pack density, that data is clear and repeatable across the literature, and it does improve aerobic stability, probably related to that packing density. Okay, I'm gonna shift then to the left. It's not time for questions yet, Casey. No, no, go ahead. Uh, what has been done on uh, dry matter loss in those lots? Again, I've been reading articles all week frantically to prepare for today, so I haven't, <laughs> Uh, to be, I mean, I'm being real frank with you, right? I, I was charged with this, and I've been trying to catch up on the dairy literature. So this is one example of one of the better studies I found where it measured processing and then the effect on, on packing. I don't remember that they measured uh, storage losses in that study, but I've, I've read lots of others, and I can't remember. So I don't, I'll, I'll be frank with you, a lot of the work that Dr. Bolson did at Kansas State has not been repeated elsewhere because you need to have replicated bunkers and most places don't do it. Or they do it in the small miniature silos. Okay, the last thing is what you've seen some of from Jim already and a little bit from Andrea, I just wanna to touch on because Henry Hilscher's done this work where we've looked at harvesting the silage at 37 or 43. We did it in finishing diets with 15% inclusion or 45% inclusion. Notice again, all diets had 40% modified distillers. Performance wise, didn't matter if you uh, had drier silage or not, if it was included at 15%, same gain, same conversion. 45% silage, same gain, same conversion. So we thought, well, that means you should put up drier silage and it won't affect things. Um, did the same thing then Henry did in growing cattle, 37, 43 uh, comparison and the conversions were a little worse on the drier silage. So I guess our recommendation is, is anything in the upper 30s is, is okay. Uh, oh, sorry, Henry's just completed a, uh, a lamb digestion study and again, uh, no real effect on, on, on uh, organic matter digestibility, but the drier silage, whether it was fed ad lib or restricted, had lower fiber digestibility. So I guess we think that, that the fiber digestibility is probably hurt if you put up a little drier silage. It's picking that up in digestibility. It picked it up in growing cattle. Didn't matter if it was finishing cattle. That's our best estimation today. I was intrigued by what the dairy literature said. Uh, again, I could show lots of individual studies, but I'm relying some on this meta-analysis. Here's my point. They can looked at, at different trials with different dry matters of silage, and even here at, in the upper 30s, milk production is just as good. It isn't, doesn't get bad till you get above 40. So I guess my recommendation or from, the, from the dairy and the beef side is, there's nothing wrong with, with silages in the 35 to 38%, 39%. Last topic uh, uh, that I wanted to at least touch on, it came up earlier, I think it came up from the panel discussion, and that's drought damage. I suppose if we talk about it today, it may happen, right? But uh, in Nebraska, we could use some rain. We got flooded, and now we could use some. But it's a good way to salvage acres in a, in a drought situation. Uh, normal, which we've already talked about, is 50-50 grain to forage. Drought damage, there's no doubt that it lowers tonnage and you, and you affect that ratio of grain to forage. Uh, if you wanna know how much grain you have there, 
Probably the best way to do that is have it analyzed for starch and take that percent starch divided by 0.7, and that'll give you a really fair estimate of how much grain you have in the silage. Now, one of the worst things to test for and analyze in the lab is what? Starch. So just keep that in mind that this is an estimate is what I would call it. Normal silage is a TDN of about in this mid-70s. We think the drought damage silage is reduced to 70-90% of normal. Maybe that's 60 to 65 percent. Is Terry still, Mater still here? Uh, I was going to give him credit for that estimate. One, two, one thing to watch, make sure you get the correct dry matter when you put up drought damage, story, uh, drought damage silage. And if it's really drought damage, watch the nitrate issue. We got really good estimates of what the impact of nitrate is. Si and siling it decreases uh, nitrate concerns, but it doesn't eliminate them. Probably no mycotoxins, especially in drought damage silage, but always worth being careful. But let's face it, finishing cattle is the best way to handle uh, probably both issues, nitrate and mycotoxin. Okay, some general conclusions then. Uh, silage inclusion matters. We've discussed that. It will increase or hurt feed to gain. There's no doubt about that. But it still may be economical, may not. You've got to wait until Terry's done talking to figure that out. Um, I think it's clear from Andrea's presentation and from our data on the finishing side, you need to have 15 to 20 percent minimum distillers grains in these diets if they're based on silage. It really seems to help. It's that RUP issue that she talked about. No impact from genetic modification, at least agronomic traits. BMR, I think we need more data. It suggests there's an improvement. Kernel processing, I'm going to conclude there's no impact and I'd be delighted to be proven wrong. I think that's got to be a data-driven decision. That may interact with moisture content of the silage, may interact with a lot of things. And then don't cut too soon. Probably going in the upper 30s, there's nothing wrong with that. Dan, with that, I'd turn it back to you or take any questions. Program. Yeah, Galen, I was just online, and, and I don't have an electronic copy of, a, of a two trials we did with drought stress corn silage at K-State in 80 and 83, but I've got those in my garage. I'd scan them and, and send them to people, but you're right on, on drought stress corn silage. It's a, it's a lot better product than, uh, than it looks like in the field standing there. Super. So I'd uh, be happy to, to uh, scan an email out to anybody that would like it. That'd and, be good. Scan an email, and then they can get it from me and, or from and, you. And in one, one trial, uh, the, the, uh, it was estimated a, a two bushel to the acre uh, uh, corn yield uh, versus 85. It's grown on two different farms, uh, two miles apart, but the same hybrid. This was the 1980 trial, and, and it really showed that that drought stress corn silage had uh, high value for growing, uh, growing cattle. It's a great way to salvage those acres because you don't have much other choice. Just a reminder, and if there's other questions, that's fine. But if you do have to take off, I understand, but turn in your name tag. And, but more importantly, the evaluation. Right, evaluations. Any other questions? I'm, I'm way questions? ahead, which Terry's going to be shocked by. Anybody left online? Yeah? No questions from them? All right. Thanks for coming. And uh, 